Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, Decarbonization and Natural Gas Rates, Cost-Effective, Equitable Paths to Zero Carbon Buildings. I'm Chris Field, Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute is Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, food, water, oceans, biodiversity, and health. And today's webinar is product of the Woods Institute's Climate and Energy Policy Program with presentations from Mike Mastrandrea, the program's research director, Allison Ong, a graduate student in Stanford's Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources, and Michael Wara, director of the Climate and Energy Policy Program. The Climate and Energy Policy Program operates at the interface of policy analysis, academic research and education, and stakeholder engagement. It serves as a practical, timely, and neutral voice focused on informing decision-making on climate and energy law and regulation. Understanding the costs, trade-offs, and consequences of policy and regulatory strategies is critical for improving our climate future and building a just, equitable, and resilient transition to a clean energy system. With that, let me turn it over to Mike Mastrandre, who is going to MC the rest of today's event. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, everyone. On behalf of my collaborators, Alison Ong and Michael Wara, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on decarbonization and natural gas rates. And as Chris mentioned, we will be presenting the results of a new white paper and an earlier policy memo from our Climate and Energy Policy Program at the Woods Institute. We have planned 15 to 20 minutes for discussion following our presentation, and you will be able to submit questions using the Q&A feature located at either the top or bottom of your Zoom screen, and we look forward to your questions and comments. So without further ado, let's get started. So California has made impressive progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from their peak in the early 2000s, and they've achieved the 2020 goal four years early in 2016. This figure shows the latest uh, state emissions data through 2018 as tracked by the California Air Resources Board's greenhouse gas inventory. And much of these economy-wide emissions reductions have occurred in the electricity sector. While we are ahead of the game for 2020, we also know that we have more work to do to reach California's ambitious goals for reducing emissions 40% below the 2020 level by 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality by 2045. This figure shows the rate of reduction needed if you draw a straight line from 2018 emissions to the 2030 emissions limit. And this is the current emissions pie across economic sectors. Given the progress to date in the electricity sector, transportation is the largest source of emissions currently in California. So while it is not the only place where progress is needed, reducing building emissions is an important part of the strategy for achieving California's goals. The commercial and residential slices of this pie that you can see on the right represent the direct emissions from buildings. But if you look at building emissions in total, they are about a quarter of this whole pie if you factor in the emissions from electricity use in buildings. Drilling down one level further, this figure shows the components of greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, both the direct emissions from building energy use and refrigerants on the left in blue, and the indirect emissions from electricity use on the right. A foundational component of California's strategy is to decarbonize electricity through SB100 and other policies, which over time will reduce the indirect emissions shown here. And most of the direct emissions in buildings come from burning of natural gas for water heating and for air heating. So there is emerging consensus among policymakers, analysts, and advocates that achieving California's economy-wide emission reduction goals will require large reductions in fossil natural gas consumption for most building energy uses. And recent work has highlighted that without a managed transition, this could lead to unsustainable increases in gas rates and customer energy bills over time particularly for customers like renters and low-income residents who are least able to switch away from gas, which raises important equity concerns. Policy and regulatory processes are underway that will help determine the pace and strategy for building decarbonization. And so with this motivation, our team has conducted new research that estimates the impacts on residential gas rates and emissions 
of building decarbonization approaches that are under consideration by policymakers and stakeholders. And as we have also analyzed the legal dimensions of building electrification. So to present our work, it is my pleasure to uh, hand it over to my collaborators, Allison Hong and Michael Wara. Allison, over to you. Thanks very much for the introduction, Mike. Looking forward to presenting our work today. So as Mike mentioned, California is facing quite a significant challenge charting the future of both the natural gas system and trying to understand how to have a managed transition to decarbonizing buildings. And alongside this, we've been observing several different policy approaches that have been arising in the literature. We've been seeing many different stakeholder groups um, put forth proposals that take a variety of approaches and have a variety of mechanisms. And so alongside this, because we see such wide ranging approaches for possibly decarbonizing buildings, we felt it was important to ensure that there was adequate focus on ratepayer impacts um, to assure affordability going forward, and also understand how these would compare to each other in terms of emissions impacts. And so to do so, we felt it was important to try and put some quantitative analysis to all of these proposals to take the wide range of policy approaches that we're seeing um, and turn this into something that was directly comparable. And so the main motivation behind our analysis is to inject some numeracy into the space, to be an objective party that says, we will look at these different types of proposals, stylize them, and allow this as an aid and a tool for both policymakers and stakeholders alike to have a way of seeing how these different approaches have relative merits in terms of both emissions impacts, as well as challenges with respect to affordability. And so keeping that in mind, um, the goal of our analysis today is to both focus on those rate impacts as well as those emission impacts. And so going forward, I'll start by giving a little bit of context about the natural gas system, some of the challenges and the ongoing issues that it may be facing, um, and then move through our analysis approach, and then finally present our results for both rates and emissions impacts. So to start things off with building a bit of intuition, as Mike said, um, there's a challenge with customer affordability that may arise as decarbonization of buildings goes forward. So to make that link, um, this is a figure presented from the E3 analysis for the CC Challenge of Retail Gas Final Report that we've borrowed from that report. And I think it does a good job of conceptually showing this link that we're talking about. So one thing that we see here is that um, there is a link between the revenue requirement, which is the cost, the total that a utility must have um, added up to, the throughput, which is the total usage. So in dollars and a total usage in therms, the dollars per therm gives you the average rate. Now, the revenue requirement or the cost for a utility are mostly made up of costs that are fixed. For a gas utility, this means that these costs are things like maintenance of the distribution system, necessary safety infrastructure investments, perhaps connecting new customers. And when I say fixed, it means they're not variable and they're things that don't necessarily scale with throughput. Because they're relatively insensitive to throughput then, an increase in costs, even if there's a decrease in throughput, would tend to spread those fixed costs over a smaller number of customers. And that puts upward pressure on rates um, because rates are volumetric in California expressed, as I said, in a dollars per therm amount. This means that going forward, should the revenue requirement increase due to investments, then this will already inherently push rates upward. As this shows, if there's a policy that even seems to decrease throughput by what looks like a small amount, this could put a significant amount of additional pressure on rates. And so we see that policy changes that either tweak revenue requirement or throughput or both will have a significant follow-on effect on the overall rate for customers. Now, why might the revenue requirement be increasing? Well, in California, many of the necessary revenue requirement increases are going to come from cost increases due to planned and crucial safety investments. Following on from the aftermath of the San Bruno disaster in 2010 with the pipeline explosion in a residential neighborhood, as well as the Lisa Canyon methane leak that happened a few years ago. These two events combined show that it is absolutely crucial that we continue to invest in necessary safety infrastructure and upgrades to ensure the safe continued operation of the natural gas system. 
Therefore, even before considering mitigation policies and considering how consumption of natural gas might change in the future, because of these crucial safety investments for the existing system, revenue requirement will continue to increase. And so what we'll see in our analysis is that already before consideration of any policies in the future under a reference scenario, there will already be an increase in rates. And so this affordability challenge is something that we have to keep in mind moving forward as we consider the additional incremental cost of any mitigation policy. Well, at the same time, as costs are increasing, there are also pressures on throughput or consumption of natural gas to decline. As this figure also taken from the CEC Challenge of Retail Gas final report shows, there's a cycle going on here. As gas rates get pushed higher due to aging infrastructure and higher costs, rates of economic building electrification continue to decline, or sorry, rates of costs for building electrification continue to decline, making building electrification more economic. This means that as costs for renewables decline, as it becomes more accessible and easy and incentives contribute towards building electrification, there will be higher rates of those transferring over from gas to electricity. Combined, these make gas demand fall. This, as explained earlier, concentrates fixed costs over a smaller customer base. This forms perhaps a vicious cycle, which push rates ever higher. And so if we're not careful about charting a managed future, such a vicious cycle could lead to an unsustainable spiraling of rates, something that would really hurt customer affordability in the future. And so the context that we've entered into now is understanding the cycle and now understanding how these different mitigation policies and proposals put in place may alter the cycle, may further push rates higher and therefore exacerbate the affordability problem and or may be an innovation that could mitigate rates. And underlying this, of course, is the need to also decarbonize and the need to understand how any policy regardless of what it does in terms of costs and affordability, is also affecting emissions for the system. That being said, we've noticed a few different approaches to this space. Generally, they split into two types of approaches for decarbonization of buildings. One is an approach that focuses on the supply side. That means that instead of the current situation of about 100% fossil natural gas in the pipeline, there would be increased investment in renewable natural gas. This is something like biomethane or synthetic natural gas or renewable hydrogen. We've noticed in California, there's been an uptick in investment in strategies for renewable natural gas integration into the pipeline. In particular, the Southern California Gas Company has made the announcement that they hope to reach 20% RNG in their pipeline by the year 2030. Besides the supply side, there are also a host of a whole suite of different measures on the demand side, which aim to electrify end uses of buildings, and in doing so, move away from natural gas and towards electrification. There are a few different mechanisms for encouraging electrification. One set of mechanisms focuses on building standards. We've seen across California that several municipalities have passed REACH codes, which in their municipality may translate to a banning of natural gas and new construction or significant electrification incentives for new construction. There are talks that for the Title 24 updates, which are California statewide building codes, um, there may be a future round where there's significant electrification contributed or in the future, perhaps even an outright ban on natural gas or moratorium on natural gas in new construction. So um, that's one possible approach to building decarbonization. Now on the demand side and electrification, another set of approaches um, for electrification is to focus on the gas appliances themselves, to move away from gas powered appliances and towards electric appliances. So as opposed to a Title 24 building code approach, this would take an air quality approach. Perhaps, um, and many environmental advocates have said that due to the significant indoor air pollution issues surrounding use of natural gas appliances, by strengthening air quality standards, we could make operation of traditional natural gas fueled home appliances infeasible and therefore induce a phasing in of electric equivalents. 
A third type of mechanism on the electrification side would involve where exactly one electrifies. So this would involve targeted electrification, which means, for example, electrifying a city block by block or by one geographic area at a time. And by targeting it, then the hope is that this enables strategic and possible decommissioning of certain natural gas infrastructure assets on the distribution system. And with strategic decommissioning, because that part of the distribution system, that branch would no longer be necessary, we term this in our report as quote unquote branch pruning. And that would allow for shrinkage of infrastructure. As mentioned earlier, if there isn't any change to the existing way that infrastructure is managed and recovered, um, and the necessity for that infrastructure, declines in throughput won't change the costs. But if there's strategic decommissioning, this is a possible way, at least conceptually, to reduce costs and keep the size of the system a little bit closer to in line with the demand of the system. Having stated that there are quite a variety of approaches, we've decided to take the attack that will turn all of these into illustrative scenarios so that we can compare them. And we can see the effect of both supply side policies and demand side policies in terms of how this might affect or break such a vicious cycle in the future. One more thing to say about our analysis, we focus on a 2035 timeframe for this, uh, reasoning being that despite some climate policies being tied to the year 2030, the year 2045, we feel this is a reasonable compromise year because some of the policies would not take effect until the mid 2020s, 2030 would be very soon. Um, and it may be difficult to see the effect of these policies until we get into the post 2030 timeframe. At the same time, going out to 2045 entails significant uncertainty in terms of modeling the California system. And so in an attempt to balance seeing the policies through to maturation and the uncertainties with modeling far out into the future, we choose a compromise year of 2035. And so that will be the year for all of our charts. Now going on to the actual modeling approach that we use for this analysis, uh, our main analysis tool here is the E3 revenue requirement tool for natural gas, which was developed in consultation with both PG&E and SoCal Gas for use in this aforementioned CEC report. And we're very grateful to E3 for the helpful conversations, the guidance, and for allowing us to have access to this, pub, to access to this model. Um, the model takes in information about revenue requirement, about costs, it takes an information about possible throughput and number of customer accounts over time. And with the, those trajectories um, and with other basic financing assumptions taken from each utility's general rate case, it combines this information to yield um, a metric of total dollar per therm rate. This total dollar per therm rate is comprised of four components. And so before going through the results of our analysis, I wanna briefly introduce each of these components and talk through what they mean. So the total gas rate, which we express as a dollar per therm or dollar per amount of energy used rate is comprised of four parts. So the first part, this bottom one, the commodity charge means essentially the supply charge, the cost of procuring the commodity itself. Currently, this is re largely a reflection of the price of conventional or fossil natural gas. In the future, if there is an increase in renewable natural gas, this commodity charge will reflect instead that proportional mixture of renewable natural gas. Because renewable natural gas tends to be more expensive still than conventional natural gas, a high RNG future may show that this commodity charge piece of the total rate will be a larger amount. This next one up is the greenhouse gas adder. The greenhouse gas adder is a reflection of the cost of carbon in dollars per ton as determined by California's cap and trade program. Generally, this price has been fairly low near the floor auction reserve price. And so we anticipate that it continues to be a non-zero but overall small contributor to total rates. The purple and yellow bars, the two at the top, are the transmission and storage charge or TNS charge and the distribution system charge. So these two combined are essentially the infrastructure costs to the system. The transmission and storage piece of the infrastructure is the quote unquote backbone of the natural gas system. It's a cost borne by all customers. And if there were any strategic decommissioning in the future, this would be last to be affected. Strategic decommissioning and that sort of thing generally tackles the distribution piece. 
Now the distribution system in contrast to backbone is sort of the quote unquote last line or the last mile of that infrastructure system. Essentially the part of the pipeline that gets it from the large transmission pipeline to a person's home. And so the distribution charge because the distribution system um, is connected to a large number of residences in California and residential customers bear a large portion of the distribution system costs is highly sensitive to changes in residential throughput. So as policies may be enacted to change natural gas consumption on the residential side, should natural gas consumption decline, this distribution charge, this yellow portion, which is already a, a very significant portion of total rates and total infrastructure costs, may change dramatically. That being said, with these four components of rates in mind, it's not entirely about affordability alone. A big part of this discussion, as mentioned before, is also about emissions. And so we, in addition to this rate analysis using the E3 revenue requirement tool, also do an approach to modeling of emissions. This figure that Mike showed earlier has been highlighted with this red circle to show that what we're really talking about here are just the direct emissions. Um, so this blue portion, not the indirect emissions. And we're talking about just the emissions from combustion. We're not talking about other things like electricity emissions from homes and those sorts of things or refrigerants. And so I wanna be clear that when we talk about emissions reductions here, um, we're essentially just looking at avoided throughput in natural gas from a given mitigation policy or a decrease in the emissions intensity of the natural gas supply from introduction of RNG. Um, we're not including power plant emissions and we're not going to include any discussion of fugitive emissions in these estimates. So for our analysis, as mentioned before, there's a reference case and there are four mitigation scenarios for a total of five. The reference case is simply the quote unquote business as usual case where no specific additional policy is undertaken to reduce natural gas usage or emissions. This of course is not to say that zero action is taken in the future. It's simply that there's no additional mitigation policy implemented. So economic rates of building electrification will continue. It's just that there will not be any specific change to mandate or induce any large scale, say, electrification efforts. That would be the realm of mitigation scenarios. For the first mitigation scenario, we're shorthand terming this Title 24. And this essentially looks at what would happen if there were a statewide moratorium on natural gas and new construction, similar to what has been proposed at times um, to the proceeding and what has already been implemented in municipalities across California. So the way we model this um, based on our current reading of the draft Title 24 standards for the next um, set of updates, we say that the reference demand will be about half because of significant electrification incentives between 2023 and 2026. And then in the subsequent round of Title 24 updates, this is when a quote unquote gas ban would take place. And so from 2026 onwards, a statewide moratorium on natural gas hookups in all new construction would take effect. This essentially caps the amount of further growth to natural gas in California. And because building stock will continue to turn over and there will be some rate of economic electrification. After 2026, there's a 1% decline in consumption per year. In contrast to Title 24, which mainly targets new buildings, our next scenarios target existing buildings as well. So this RNG scenario is a reflection of that SoCal gas proposal mentioned earlier, where um, the concentration of renewable natural gas would reach 20% by 2030. We just modeled this simply linearly as a 2% increase per year beginning in 2021. And because it's not quite feasible to say that they reach 20% and stop, we just continue this into the future, assuming that the technology is feasible so that by the year 2035, Again, our target analysis year, it reaches an effective approximately 30%. And so what this does is that this combines the um, a usage in the pipeline of different types of renewable natural gas, depending on our reading of what we feel is feasible and what we've seen in various reports as being maximum percentages possible in the pipeline. So this effectively would mean that it's 
15% maximum of biomethane, which reflects a figure used in the CEC's analysis, and then a maximum of 8% hydrogen in the pipeline. So any balance beyond the sum of that would have to be fulfilled by synthetic natural gas, which to my understanding is being invested in, though it hasn't yet been deployed at a commercially large scale. Besides the RNG scenario, which is mentioned tackles the supply side of, renewable, of natural gas in California, then our next, our third mitigation scenario is an appliance ban. The way we modeled this is beginning 2026, the, scale, the sale of new gas fueled appliances would be prohibited and this would result in phase in of electric equivalents. For simplicity, we modeled the average approximate lifetime of gas appliance is about 15 years. And so simply from 2026 onwards for the next 15 years, a reduction one fifteen of the consumption in appliances. At this time, I want to also briefly say that with an appliance ban, um, it's important to understand which appliances are mostly being targeted. So this figure shows the distribution of gas consumption in commercial and residential um, buildings in California by end use. And what this is saying is that of this red portion, there, it is mainly comprised of this light blue, which is residential water heating, and the light green, which is residential HVAC. Um, stoves are not a huge portion of it, though much of the rhetoric has been focused around the transfer from gas stoves to electric stoves. Um, but in reality, an appliance ban would mainly target HVAC and water heaters. And our final scenario is branch pruning. So from 2023 onwards, we say that there would be an increasing amount of strategic decommissioning and there'd be strategic retirements and distribution infrastructure assets. And this would take place alongside targeted electrification. So reinvestment in the distribution system would decline to an eventual 20% over a 10 year period. And at the same time, um, the amount of quote unquote prunable customers would increase over time as this plan moves forward. Taken together, uh, we can see a summary of how this would affect throughput across the state in this chart. So the first thing to note is that um, the gold line, the RNG scenario um, directly overlaps with the reference scenario because it's only a supply side measure. And so it doesn't model any additional changes or reductions in consumption. So its throughput trajectory is the same. However, for the others, because they affect demand to different degrees, we see that the Title 24 scenario results in moderate declines in demand, while something like an appliance ban or branch pruning scenario would result in far steeper declines in demand over time. But this doesn't tell the story about how it affects customer affordability. So in our next figure, we show in summary what the effect on average residential rates by scenario would be in the year 2035, expressed in terms of real dollars per therm. Because this is a real dollar number, uh, we can compare how it is in 2020 versus 2035 reference. And so this first bar is actually how the rate would be in 2020. And this is important because what we wanna emphasize here is that in 2035 already, there will be significant affordability challenges. So before going to the mitigation policies, we already see that the 2035 reference case is quite a bit more expensive. And this, as mentioned before, is largely a reflection of planned and necessary safety infrastructure investments, as well as expected declines in throughput from efficiency and economic building electrification. Therefore, we have to consider these four mitigation scenarios as incremental costs also on top of a 2035 reference. We see that a Title 24 ban, even though it's a moratorium perhaps across all new construction in California, actually results in fairly moderate impacts to rates. In contrast, these other policies, such as implementation of a higher amount of RNG or an appliance ban, would result in far greater average residential rates. And of course, the higher this total bar, the more expensive it is for customers in terms of dollars per therm. And this is clearly a suboptimal outcome from an affordability standpoint. We note that branch pruning is largely similar in total cost to the Title 24 scenario, meaning that despite having greater declines in natural gas consumption, it's about as quote unquote expensive of a policy as a Title 24 style gas ban across California and would be cheaper from a total dollar per therm perspective um, relative to an RNG scenario or an appliance ban scenario. But of course, the rate is also only half the story. 
we have to ultimately look at the effect on emissions of these decarbonization policies. And so in this final chart, we show the emissions decrease in terms of annual emissions relative to the 2035 reference scenario. So here, the higher the bar, the larger the percentage in emissions reductions and the better the outcome in terms of decarbonization. What we see here is relative to the reference case, generally speaking, the amount of emission reductions scales with the cost of the policy. So for a moderately expensive policy like Title 24, you can achieve moderate emissions reductions. For something a little bit more like an appliance ban, something that's more expensive, you can achieve larger emissions reductions. So that's better from a decarbonization perspective, but comes at the cost of a quote unquote more expensive policy. But the exception here is the stylized branch pruning scenario. And so at the end of the day, what our chart is showing and the story that it tells is that with careful consideration to strategic decommissioning and to paying attention to the cost on the system, it may be possible to achieve similar outcomes in terms of decarbonization to a more involved policy um, at a relatively more moderate cost increase. And so our conclusions can be summed up as follows. First, these building decarbonization policy decisions, these discussions that are happening today, will have large effects into the future. They might result in extremely large and wide ranging impacts. And that's true for both the customer affordability and rate standpoint, as well as for the emissions and decarbonization standpoint. Second, the cost of near-term safety investments will already be substantial. So even before considering additional mitigation policy, affordability will be a key challenge. Third, policies that are focused on new construction alone will have relatively modest impacts relative to those that focus on all buildings, including existing ones. And this is true for impacts across rates as well as emissions. And fourth, there is clearly the potential for strategic electrification to be a win-win situation if done carefully. It may enable favorable outcomes as in larger amounts of emission reduction for relatively more moderate policy expense and cost expense for customers. However, in order to successfully implement strategic electrification and quote unquote branch pruning, this will entail several challenges, particularly legal ones and ones involving procedural justice and the obligation to serve. Um, thanks very much for listening to this presentation about the white paper results. And now here to talk a little bit more about some of those legal challenges around strategic electrification and around the future of the natural gas system. I'm pleased to turn it over to Michael Wara. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Allison, for that great presentation. And as Allison mentioned, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, some of the legal analyses that were done by uh, a number of our law students, Nicholas Wallace and Amanda um, Zerby, who are currently studying for their bar exams. They're probably in Barbary class as we speak. If you're a lawyer, you know what I mean, and it probably causes you pain to think about. Um, so they're not here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on their behalf. Um, we looked at this question of branch pruning um, and uh, in, a, in a separate paper, Removing Legal Barriers to Building Electrification, which you can find and I think will be linked in the chat, um, and focused on um, issues related to substitution of service. Right? Effectively, what's going on um, in a, a building electrification context is that gas service is being substituted with um, electrical service. Both are regulated um, essential utility services subject to PUC regulation in California or utility commission regulation generally. And therefore, um, the, the providers of those services are, are um, obligated to provide just and reasonable service um, of, of reasonable quality and to all customers that ask for them. And there are questions that come up um, with respect to um, both substantive and procedural um, barriers uh, to or sub substantive barriers and procedural requirements that, 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 that come up as we think about that kind of a substitution of service. Successful branch pruning is going to require substitution of an alternative energy service, so switching from um, natural gas provided over its distribution system to an all electric home. So probably, um, you know, homes are both served by both natural gas and 
electricity um, to a substantial degree in California. Most customers in California have a mixed fuel home or live in a mixed fuel home. It will also require abandonment or removal of infrastructure in the street, right? The gas distribution lines that are in the street and attached to a customer's home. And significantly, in order for all of that to work, it's going to require some creation of finality for the utilities that are um, substituting electric for natural gas service, right? One can imagine a situation where a branch is pruned, um, infrastructure is either abandoned or removed, a new um, resident moves into the area and then um, might want to have natural gas service, perhaps because they like having a gas stove, perhaps because they prefer living in a mixed fuel home for other reasons. And theoretically, under existing law, um, under the obligation to serve, they could require that the utility provide service even after the infrastructure that was providing that service has been abandoned. And that could create enormous costs for the utility, might create a reluctance on the part of the utility to abandon or remove infrastructure. And that might mean that um, you see you know, a, a, a lack of willingness to move forward on this strategy, which in our rate analysis, which Alice just presented, looks pretty, pretty cost effective and potentially um, uh, good from an emission standpoint as well. Next. Wallace and, um, and Zerbe did a, did a ton of work looking at the issue, issues around the obligation to serve, the, 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 the law governing the utilities obligation to provide just and reasonable service, and examples where that service had been substituted. Shown on the right is a picture of the Golden Gate Transit Ferry, which in, in Larkspur uh, in Marin County, and the bus, um, which Golden Gate Transit also operates. Many of the substitution of service cases that we have um, occurred when as bridges were built and bus service became available as an alternative to ferries for water crossings. Both um, in the early days were subject to rate of um, rate regulation cost of service regulation. And so there were there, there were multiple cases where um, bus service was more affordable, it was more convenient, but some customers still wanted to have that ferry ride rather than take the bus to work. And they protested when the utilities providing ferry service um, started to restrict service or even eliminated it. So the question was, um, you know, how to handle these holdouts, how to, how to think about um, the 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 um, the substitution of service and 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 the clear answer coming out of the case law and this is not so much California case law but looking nationally is that such substitution of service is allowed when the substitute service being provided is of um, similar quality uh, and availability and cost to the um, to the customers and where maintaining the 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 um, older service would would impose unreasonable costs on the broader class of ratepayers. At the same time, there's an important body of law governing the process by which an essential service such as natural gas service can be taken away from customers, right? There are procedural rights associated with the deprivation of a service or, or, a, or a benefit to customers. And long, um, well-established U.S. Supreme Court protections on the deprivation or alteration of essential government services, which are, have been extended to include the services provided by investor-owned uh, utilities. In general, we find and we, we conclude that these procedural issues are manageable, particularly given the norms of participatory community-driven decision-making um, that have been established in California. I think the best, most recent example of these procedural and participatory norms is the San Joaquin Valley energy pilots, which were a process run to provide um, either electrification or natural gas service to small communities, agricultural communities in the Central Valley that had historically had to rely on propane as their primary um, source of heating and heating and, um, and hot water. And um, the process the PUC adopted was, was really well received and accepted by the communities. There was a real effort made to engage with the communities and some sort of um, 
you know, process that's similar to that, we believe would likely be important for communities that were essentially opting in to electrification. So branches in our, in our view would be important um, uh, only, it'd be important only that the branches are pruned after there is community buy-in, community acceptance, and to meet the constitutional protections, sufficient time for um, community members to actively engage with the PUC around the branch printing process. Um, of course, there would also, and we note this in the paper, have to be, you know, significant programs established to make sure that when the natural gas service was discontinued, uh, there'd been adequate time and, and assistance to make sure that everyone in a community has installed uh, electric heat pumps uh, for water heating, home heating, and, and, and is, has gotten alternative um, uh, stoves as well, uh, induction cooktops and electric ovens. We think that in California, given the history, given the avowed um, interest of the PUC, that there is definitely a path forward to meet the procedural requirements. So the key barriers probably are a lack of clarity with respect to um, the statutory authority to allow substitution of service. And so we recommend in the vapor um, clarifying language that um, might not necessarily be required, right? We think that this, the PUC actually has um, sufficient authority right now to allow for this kind of branch pruning approach, substitution of electric for mixed fuel service with, at a residential, for a residential customer. But certainly that clarifying that authority, creating greater certainty would benefit all parties. Um, and we recommend a variety of approaches to doing that that are spelled out in some detail in the paper. In conclusion, I just note, I would commend that the, that the students that work, did this work, um, took the lead on this work, that transitioning from mixed fuel to all electric really requires legal certainty. The, the cost of the infrastructure involved, um, the issues around holdouts and kind of are, are, are real and, um, and need to be addressed if this is gonna be a policy that can move forward. Um, the authority is somewhat unclear to take these steps. And so there's benefit to clarifying that the PUC does have authority to allow a utility and a community if they want to prune a branch of the natural gas system. Even with clear legal authority, we argue that attention needs to be paid to the due process rights of customers and communities. And that the right way to do that is to model uh, the, the or, or scale the approach that was taken in the San Joaquin Valley Energy Pilots, maybe make it a bit more, um, a bit less resource intensive for the commission, but still to provide a clear avenue for communities, particularly low income and moderate income communities um, in California to participate in the decision about whether to maintain mixed fuel or electrify. And I would just say that in conclusion that getting these substance, substantive and procedural issues right is really the key to doing um, building decarbonization in a, in, in a just transition. And so we should be paying attention to them. I think that um, I'm heartened to see that the, the engagement of communities, both in Northern and Southern California related to these issues, the engagement of the utilities, um, both in Northern and Southern California, and, um, and the attention the PUC has placed and really prioritized on um, this issue of community engagement when big choices are being made about uh, how to achieve what we all want, which is a low carbon economy, um, but also um, one that, that is fair to all parties, especially those that struggle to afford uh, the cost of living in California. Thank you very much, Michael and Allison. And now we are going to transition to the Q&A section of the webinar and see already a rich set of questions in the Q&A function. Just as a reminder, uh, please submit questions using that Q&A feature located in the menu bar, either at the bottom or top of your Zoom screen. And we will try to get through as many of the questions as we can in the remaining time. So to get us started, I'd like to ask a question of Allison Ong. Uh, and this is relevant to a question from Thomas Smith, uh, as well as some others. The analysis that you presented looks at the effects of each policy individually. And can you comment on what might be the effects of multiple policies being implemented at the same time, for instance, a Title 24 uh, building code approach as well as RNG uh, coming into the system? Yeah, so 
Um, as described in the analysis, the RNG scenario, which would be a supply side change, was considered separate from any reduction in demand so that we could see the effect of just changing the supply on rates and emissions. But if you stack them and say combine a policy that both uh, tries to decarbonize supply and another one, which is likely to happen in California, that may, for example, encourage electrification, then what you would see is that in addition to the increases in supply costs and the upward pressure on rates from that, you would also have the issue of declining demand, which would spread those fixed costs over fewer customers. And so they would have an additive effect where both the sort of commodity portion of the rate would go up and then also the portion of say the infrastructure charge like the distribution charge would rise too. So you'd have an even larger effect on total rates. You may also have a larger effect on total emissions, um, but these two effects would both go hand in hand. They would essentially work in the same direction. So another question that we've had too is um, about the uh, appliance ban scenario as well. And I'll direct this one, Allison, Allison to you as well. Um, does that assume that uh, residential natural gas appliances are banned um, or would that focus, for instance, just on space and water heating? Uh, there's a question of whether, you know, if you were not targeting uh, stoves, how that would affect the rate scenarios. Right, so one picture that I showed in the presentation of that pie chart um, demonstrates that most of the end uses consumption by percentage comes from HVAC and water heating. And so stoves, um, regardless of whether you tackle them or not, are not going to be a large percentage, probably less than 20% of the natural gas used in the home. And so what we model is actually more of a stylized banning of natural gas, HVAC, and water heating. And so that's why in our appliance ban scenario, the total declining consumption is more like about 80%. So this looks at the effects of essentially just banning um, water heaters and, and home heating and HVAC and not actually stoves too. Um, if you did include stoves, these effects would be a little bit more significant, would be a little bit higher, but it doesn't change the overall story. And in fact, doesn't much change the overall magnitude of things because stove usage is a small overall portion of natural gas home usage. Great, thank you. And now for Michael, there's a question about whether there are substantial differences in either cost or emissions reductions outcomes if you're thinking about Northern California versus Southern California given both the differences in utility structures, housing construction patterns, uh, and, and other differences between them. Caroline Spears and others have asked about this. Well, I think the, the first thing to note is that there are important differences in terms of the industrial, the industry structure in Northern and Southern California. In Northern California, um, by and large, not completely, Pacific Gas and Electric owns both the electric and the gas system. That simplifies some of the legal and regulatory issues related to substitution of service because it's one entity substituting uh, electric for natural gas service. By contrast, in Southern California, uh, Southern California Edison and LA Department of Water and Power provide electricity to most of Southern California. And SoCal Gas, a separate company, provides gas service. In San Diego, of course, um, Sempra Energy, which is the owner of SoCal Gas, provides both gas and electric. Um, it's easier to, to manage this process when you have a, um, a uni unified ownership pattern, um, you know, where, where one entity is, is, is strategically planning both gas and electric service together. I think the, the, the commission is going to need to play an important role where there is separate ownership to make sure that the decisions being made reflect the best interests of all ratepayers, um, both gas and electric ratepayers. And I think the, the long-term solution there is really to move toward integrated resources planning, which is kind of the long-term planning process that the utility commission engages in that covers not just the electric system, which is what happens today, but also the gas side. You know, we, and, and I think that the utility, the utility commission in California is, is making good strides in this, in this direction. Um, we actually have projects underway at Stanford to build models that will allow optimization across the gas and electric system that I'm very excited about um, that are sort of in development. And, and I think that's, that's the way forward, right? It is, and, and that will allow us to make good decisions where a big investment has to be made for a safety upgrade or just because a component in the system is getting old, 
we might decide instead to, to target that area for electrification. That's where we're gonna achieve the greatest um, cost benefits from a branch pruning approach. It's also true though that, you know, a lot of the, there's a lot of innovation and, um, and, and still a lot of uncertainty around the costs of the RNG strategy. And we struggled with this in, in our report and in, in Allison's work, um, you know, figuring out what a, what a, what a balanced or sort of fair approach to, to pricing that strategy looks like. And it could turn out that, that we get surprised in a good way. And RNG turns out to be the, or sort of a, a zero carbon gas strategy using the existing pipelines turns out to be more affordable than we currently think it will be. And that would be great. Um, but we we're using the information we have now, to, and, and we actually try to try to err on the side of making everyone's case look as favorable as it can be to the people that are that are proposing it. Um, so we're trying to really be balanced here. Um, but I think the you know, and I guess the only other factor that may impact cost in all of this is that uh, in general, uh, home production, new home production, is is a bit higher in Southern California than in Northern California, and so the uh, new home impact right if, if that's the if that's the policy approach we take sort of a title 24 approach is going to have larger effects in southern california than in northern california but the honest thing the truth is we don't build enough houses in california generally and so um those kind of approaches take a very long time to have big impacts to the system thanks and building on that, and this is now directed to Allison, there's several questions uh, in the list around the emissions estimates that you presented and uh, questions around uh, that focusing on just the avoided throughput as opposed to emissions associated with electricity usage or fugitive emissions and, and what effects those might have on the different estimates. Absolutely, and we acknowledge that fugitive emissions are significant. Um, and we also acknowledge that any action towards electrification because it would increase the use of electricity um, in the state would indirectly increase emissions from the electric sector and that's a significant challenge too. So we're aware of those um, for the scope of this report in order to have a simple metric and a direct metric of just evaluating change in natural gas. That's why those figures only reflect direct changes in emissions reductions. However, in a future study, we hope to incorporate a more full perspective of what's going on in the system, because this would certainly change the story or modify it around the impacts of electrification. Um, so we want to be clear about what we're including, what we're not including, and we certainly also acknowledge that this would be significant from a system overall planning perspective to have in a future work. Great, thank you. Um, Michael, directing to you, a question from Bob Hitchner, who says, listening to this presentation, it feels as if we are facing big changes in our future, but how about now? And uh, can you talk a little bit about the decisions that have already been made or are underway, and what are the most likely early decisions that will see us moving in these directions? Well, what I'd, I'd say in response to that is that, you know, the, the, our motivation for doing this work was um, that we see, you know, that there, there have been, is, is that we see a variety of decisions being made. We see decisions on the kind of horizon. Um, you know, 2026, believe it or not, is not very far away from a regulatory perspective um, in the energy system. Things move, you know, at the speed of a maybe a fast moving glacier um, within energy regulatory spaces. Um, so, uh, and that's because, you know, the capital and, and infrastructure involved is, is so long lived and, and so expensive. Um, but near term, what we've seen are a number of communities in Northern California, especially, but also some in Southern California, uh, enacting what are called reach codes, which, which create very strong incentives, not necessarily mandates, but very strong incentives to build all electric new residential uh, construction. So new homes, are all electric in these communities. That, it, it, at the same time, we've seen a number of communities in Southern California um, adapting, adopting ordinances that are kind of right to choose ordinances, um, you know, that, that, that mandate that new construction have an option to be mixed fuel, um, like most existing homes are. And that's, that's what's kind of been happening in sort of a piecemeal way. 
The Utility Commission also has a long-term um, gas uh, planning proceeding where they're starting to think through some of these long-term issues around how we how we align our natural gas system planning with our greenhouse gas goals at this in the state. And then I'd also say, you know, we've we, this is we've been really focused on California here, and 40 million people live in California. It's a big state, fifth largest economy in the world. But New York, Massachusetts, other states are starting to think about these issues as well. Massachusetts in particular has a pretty well-developed proceeding going um, at their utility commission about these issues. And many of the, the, the technical details are different. Obviously it's different climate as well. That's important when it comes to the, uh, app, the cost and, and applicability of heat pumps. Um, but many of the legal issues transfer. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of the legal analysis we did um, is likely to, you know, you want to go and look, but it, it is likely to be re highly relevant in other states because utility law is so consistent across um, states in the United States. Excellent. Well, I believe that we are getting close to the end of time. And so uh, I know that there are many questions that we did not get to answer. And first, I want to thank our panelists one more time, Alison Ong and, and Michael Wara, and also thank all of you for attending and for your excellent questions and comments. Please don't hesitate to follow up if you would like to continue the conversation, and we will look to answer some of those additional questions offline. With that, I, I thank everyone one last time, and thank you for attending.